Hi guys, in this video we're going to look at graphing waves, then we'll look at describing waves, amplitude, wavelength, frequency, period, and then we'll finish with a summary. To describe waves accurately, we're going to want to draw them on graphs. For example, imagine that we are looking at a ripple of water. How are we going to put this ripple of water onto a graph? Well, first of all, we take this ripple of water and we draw it as if we're looking directly from the side. If we look directly side on at this image, what we would see is this. Let's imagine that the distance between the top bit of any two of these waves is four centimetres. We'll be more precise about the words that we're using to describe the bits of the waves later on in this video. Let's imagine also that at its highest, the wave is one centimetre above the normal height of the pond. So we know that when there's no ripple, we would expect the water to be at this height here. And then this sentence here says, at its highest, the wave is one centimetre above the normal height of the pond. So what we're saying is, imagine that this distance here was one centimetre. And of course, this distance here would also be one centimetre. And so at its lowest, we can see that the wave is one centimetre below the normal height of the pond. Now, the good thing that we've managed to do here is we've managed to use some numbers to describe our wave. Once we've done this, we can represent our wave with the following graph. So if we imagine that everything is being measured in centimetres here, then the top of this graph is one centimetre above zero. And this zero here is where all the water would be if there was no ripple. And the bottom of the wave is one centimetre below this level. We also find that if we look back at our picture, the distance between the top of the wave and the next time the wave is at the top was four centimetres. In general, we expect any cycle of this wave to be four centimetres. So if we look back at our wave here, We've drawn it so that as we go through one full cycle of the wave, we get to four centimetres. So we have successfully managed to represent our wave on a piece of graph paper. We're going to start being more precise about waves now. And there are some special words we're going to use for the important parts of a wave. So we'll start with the crest or the peak. This is the top of the wave. So from looking at our graph of the wave, we see that there isn't just one crest or peak. There's a number of crest or peaks. We could consider this to be the top of the wave or equivalently here or equivalently here. On the other hand, the bottom of the wave is referred to as the trough. So whereas this here is the peak, this here would be the trough or equivalently, of course, this point here. Now, in the previous slide, I kept wanting to talk about where the water would be at if there was no ripple, no wave going through it. And we have a word for this, and we call this the undisturbed position. It's the position of the medium when there is no wave traveling through the medium. So for example, on this graph, our undisturbed position is this line here. It is, for example, where all the water would be if there was no wave going through it. Finally, let's talk about the wavefront. The wavefront is a line which shows all the points on a wave which are at the same height. Now, the wavefront isn't something we can draw on one of these graphs. Instead, it's a line we draw on a picture of a wave. We're looking to draw a line that shows all the points which are at the same height. So let's start at some point on our wave. Let's say this point here. If we want to draw a wavefront, we need to draw a line which stays at the same height. So for example, here stays at the top of the wave. Alternatively, this here would also be a wavefront, a line that stays at the bottom of the wave. And of course, any line at any other intermediate height would also be a wavefront. So these three here are all wavefronts. So there are loads and loads of wavefronts that we could draw, but there are many, many more lines which are not wavefronts. So for example, this line here covers points at lots of different heights. 
and is therefore not a wavefront. Let's move on to some other words that we're going to use to describe our wave now. So let's take a look at a picture of a ripple on the surface of some water. Now in the first slide when we were trying to work out how to draw a graph of a wave, one distance I was trying to draw was from the top of the wave to the place where the water would be if there was no wave going through it. In other words, I was trying to find the distance between what we now know is called a peak and the undisturbed position. So why was I interested in that distance anyway? Well, we can say how big a wave is by measuring how high the top of the wave is above the surface of the water. And we would call this the amplitude of the wave. So this length here, we're going to call the amplitude. And it's much easier to see this on a graph. So the amplitude is going to be the distance from the top of the wave to where the surface of the water would have been. So that's this length here. But again, now that we know that this point here is called a peak, and that this height here would be called the undisturbed position, we can make the definition of this amplitude more precise. We say that the amplitude of a wave is the maximum displacement on the wave from the undisturbed position. And that's exactly what this amplitude we've drawn here is. It's the furthest that the wave manages to get away from the undisturbed position. And so the reason we've introduced this idea of amplitude is because the amplitude is a way for us to say how big our wave is. So let's take a look at an example. Let's look at this wave and find out what its amplitude is. Well, we can see that this line here is in the middle of the wave. So we know that this represents the undisturbed position. We can see that this point here is a peak of the wave. So we need to find the distance from this peak, this maximum displacement to the undisturbed position. And we see that that distance is two. So our amplitude is two. Okay, let's try and introduce another term now, the term called wavelength. So let's take a look at our wave. We want to say how long each cycle of the wave is. What do we mean by this? Well, the wave is repetitive, it repeats itself. And so if we start at some point and we just follow the wave around, eventually we get back to where we started, where we're at the same position and we're on the way up again. We could say at this point that we've been through one cycle of the wave. So what this means is that when we see a wave, if we want to accurately put it on a piece of graph paper like this, we're going to need to know how long each one of these cycles is. Well, since this is going to be such an important number, we're going to give it a special name. So we say that the wavelength is the distance between the same point on two adjacent waves. Now in this definition, when we say two adjacent waves, what we mean is two cycles of a wave that are next to each other. So for example, we consider what we've drawn in pink here to be one of the waves and then an adjacent wave or an adjacent cycle of the wave would be this here. And then we're told that to find the wavelength, we need to find the distance between the same point on these two waves. So let's find the distance between the start of each of these two waves. Well, this is the start of our first cycle of the wave this here is the start of our second cycle of the wave. And so we see that the distance that we've drawn on the piece of paper is indeed what we're now going to call the wavelength. So again, just continuing to unpack this definition. When we say to adjacent waves, adjacent means the same thing as next door neighbor. So for example, if we were looking at this cycle of our wave here, then it's adjacent waves would be this wave here and this cycle of a wave here. And we know that we find this wavelength by finding the distance between the same point on two of these adjacent waves. We can choose any pair of points which are one cycle apart to measure this wavelength. 
For example, like we said before, we could take the distance between the start of the first cycle and the start of the second cycle. Alternatively, we could take the bottom of the first cycle and the bottom of the second cycle. Both of these lengths are the same, and so either of them we can use to measure the wavelength. Alternatively, we can choose some other point, for example, this point here. And this, we find the equivalent point on the next wave cycle, which is this point here. And again, if we measured it, we would get the wavelength. So we can choose any pair of points to measure the wavelength, but it's always easiest to use the peaks or the troughs. So remember the tops of the waves are what we call the peaks and the bottoms of the waves are what we call the troughs. And the reason it's easier to use the peaks or the troughs is that it's harder to make a mistake. Let's say for example we wanted to find the wavelength, we start by looking at one of the peaks and all we need to do to find the wavelength is measure the distance to an adjacent peak. In other words, another point which is at the same height. But let's say we chose to measure from this point here instead. We need to find the equivalent point on another cycle of the graph. Now the correct point to choose would be this point here. Since this point is one cycle, one full cycle of the wave away from the first point. However, it is very common to make the mistake of accidentally measuring to this point here instead, because it's at the same height. But of course this distance here is nothing special and is certainly not our wavelength. So to avoid making this mistake, we usually measure our wavelengths either using the peaks or the troughs. Now we have a special symbol that we use to represent the wavelength. And the symbol we use is the Greek letter lambda. So let's take a look at a quick example to check that we understand this concept of wavelength. What is the wavelength of this wave? Well to find the wavelength we're going to want to find the distance between two peaks. So let's use this peak here and this peak here. And then the distance between them we just take a look on the axis. We have one, two, three, four, so that's a wavelength of four. Remember we use the symbol of lambda to represent wavelength. So let's consider again as our example of a wave, a ripple on water. And when we're talking about the new word that we want to introduce, which is frequency, we should remember that this ripple is a moving wave. As in it doesn't just look kind of wavy, it is a wave which is moving from one place to another. So here's something we might be interested in doing. We could sit by the water and count how many peaks go past us. So we could sit and watch as this peak goes past us and then later on this peak will go past us and even later this peak will go past us. We could ask how many peaks go past us in a certain amount of time. Well the number of peaks that go past us in one second has a special name. We call it the frequency. And the frequency is represented by the letter F. And to define the frequency properly, we say that the frequency is the number of waves that pass a point in one second. But of course, if three full wave cycles have passed us in one second, then that means we have a frequency of three. The frequency is the number of waves which pass a point in one second. We're told that three full waves pass a point in one second. So therefore our frequency is free. But this should look odd because most physical quantities we always want to put some units at the end. So whenever we give a physics answer we need to give it units. So what are the units of frequency? The unit of frequency is called Hertz. We draw it like this, a capital H and a small z. And so our final answer should have been the frequency is equal to 3 Hertz. And again, so one hertz means one wave passes by per second. And so for example, if a wave has a frequency of eight hertz, how many waves are passing by in one second? Well, the idea is that one hertz means one wave passes by per second. 
And so then 8 hertz means that 8 waves pass by per second. And now we have one final word to introduce that we use to describe waves. So let's consider again our ripple of water, which is a wave. Now before we were counting how many waves went past us in one second. This time we could sit by the water and time how long it takes for one complete wave to pass by. So how long does it take for this wave to go through one complete cycle in front of us? So let's just focus in on one cycle of the wave. We're wanting to time how long it takes for this much of the wave to pass us. And we're going to call this time the period. So the time taken for a full cycle of a wave to pass any point is called the period of the wave. We can imagine that this sort of quantity might end up in calculations. So we're going to need a symbol to represent it. So in calculations, we give the period the symbol T. So here's the capital T and this means period. It turns out there's some interesting equations to do with the period. We can work out the period of a wave from its frequency. It turns out that the period is equal to one divided by the frequency. And on the other hand, we can also work out the frequency from the period. So here's our frequency. And just by rearranging the above equation, it can be shown that the frequency is one divided by the period. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples then. A wave has a frequency of five hertz. What is the period of the wave? Well, we're being asked to calculate the period, so we're going to need this equation. And we've been told that the frequency is five hertz. So the period must be one over five. And this is equal to 0 0.2. So that must be 0 0.2 seconds. Since the period is a time, it's measured in seconds. Let's have a go at doing things the other way around. We're told that a wave has a period of 0 0.25 seconds. What is the frequency of the wave? This time we're being asked to calculate the frequency, so we need the other equation. We need one over the period, and we've been told that the period is 0 0.25 seconds. So we need one divided by 0 0.25. And putting this into a calculator gives four, so the frequency must be four hertz. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing GCSE physics and combined science resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the SnapRevise smiley face, and together, let's make physics at GCSE a walk in the park.